about 30 million years ago, an airy climate turned part of America into a desert. Five to ten million years later, cacti began to actively spread all around the place. This is what they looked like at that time. Yes, no spines. It's quite difficult to recognize this weird plant as a cactus, but give it a little more time and the cactus will look like the one we're used to. Not only has it become easier for cacti to survive in arid spots without leaves, some of the herbivores have also lost their food source, but as we know when one creature improves its defense, another one levels up its attack. <gasps> Now imagine the only food left on Earth is cacti. There's nothing else like it all. What are you going to do? This goddamn cactus. How do I eat you? Yeah, it'll take years of evolution to adapt to such a diet, but there are animals that have already done that. The camels, they seem to be designed to survive in the desert, which means they can feed on whatever grows there. When you're an herbivore, you can't really be picky, and any plants will do including camel thorns and cacti. Yes, camels do eat them. They swallow them entirely right along with the spines, and that doesn't bother them. But why? If you stumbled across a cactus at least once, you know that any contact with its spines is as nasty as it gets. Ah! Oh my gosh, that's the worst. That's the worst killing attack I've ever seen. Even if you thorn stuck into the skin is very painful. But here we're talking about mucosa. To understand how it works, you have to look into the camel's mouth. I warn you right away, this might get weird. First, the camel has very tough lips, but this is just the beginning. The entire inner part of the camel's mouth is lined with unusual structures called papillae, palate, cheeks, tongue. Everything is covered with these hard formations. They're partly made of keratin, the same hard stuff your nails are made of, and it helps camels chew things that aren't supposed to be chewed at all. Also, the papillae move the spines down the pharynx, this way, the sharp ends do not pierce the camel when it swallows them. Oh, by the way, apparently even having the opportunity to eat something else, camels still don't mind eating a cactus. Looks like they just like, well, you know how some people love food that's too spicy even if it hurts them. Are you already convinced? Camels are much cooler than you used to think. Wait, that's not all. The wild bacterian camel that lives in China and Mongolia has evolved so much, it has learned to drink salt water. To be honest, I don't know a single animal capable of something like that, but it still wasn't enough for the camel. And he learned to withstand high levels of radiation. The thing is nuclear tests were once carried out in the habitat of this species, and you know what? Camels just don't care. Maybe they'd start eating the warheads if they found them, but let's leave the camels for now and address another important question. Why do animals eat something that looks a little like food anyway? Most, sometimes they just don't have a choice. If you live in a remote region with an unpleasant climate, you can't be a picky eater. Either you eat some nasty looking thorn or you die in a heroic manner. Usually, animals prefer to adapt. Another reason is the need to adapt to evolutionary changes. Plants are not happy when they get eaten. so they do all it takes to prevent this from happening. They grow thorns or become poisonous. In response, herbivores have to adapt and also evolve. Then predators join it. In short, you get the idea. So camels probably did not start to eat cacti right away. Scientists still have not fully figured out their evolutionary journey, but it seems like it began in a classical way with soft, juicy leaves. Then the ancestors of camels switched to a mixed diet and finally began to adapt to the lack of water. Perhaps this happened after the migration to Africa when they first saw cacti. But there is another reason why animals start a weird diet, and that is lack of rivals. Imagine that you constantly, no really, constantly have to struggle to get a favorite snack in the mall in time. Everyone damn. Day. No wonder you may get bored and think maybe I should get something else. What's the point of constantly arguing with other customers over a chocolate bar when there are always crackers that no one eats? The bearded vulture must have thought so too, like other scavengers in feeds mainly on the remains of dead animals. But while its closest kin is hunting for meat, the bearded vulture goes for bones. That is literally, it usually ignores regular meat and lives on a diet that is 85 to 90% bone marrow. To get to the bone marrow, it has to eat bones. But the bearded vulture has no problem with that. Its stomach can digest any bone in just 24 hours. By the way, no other animal can feed on bones. You see what I'm getting at. The bearded vultures even figured out how to deal with large bones to save energy. 
they lift the prey into the air and then drop it on stones, breaking it into small pieces. That's it. Dinner is served. Actually, this is a common technique. Sometimes bearded vultures want to eat a turtle and they also drop it from a great height so that they can crack open the shell. Good news, this method really works. Bad news, once a bird dropped a turtle from a great height, right onto the ancient Greek playwright Aeschylus, mistaking his bald head for a stone. These birds just have no rival species, especially after they've taken care of Aeschylus. Okay, okay, that was a bad. So bearded vultures have no competition in the animal kingdom and bones have no expiration date, unlike meat, which spoils too quickly. The entire area where the bearded vultures live is like a huge pantry where they can grab a delicious bone at any time. Also, animals keep getting born and dying, which means an endless supply of bones. Not bad, huh? Lions have to spend their whole life fighting for prey putting a lot of effort in fighting off hyenas. Bearded vulture just needs to take off and look down below. I wonder if bones somehow affect the health of the birds, like they ate calcium and their skeleton became as strong as wolverine, without any adamantium, or if they gain strength and speed, like asterix after a magic potion or, okay, that doesn't work like that, but your diet can easily make you poisonous. Common box turtles are too slow to be juicy eaters. So, they eat everything including mushrooms, which are poisonous to humans. According to the book by C. Kenneth Dodd, it simply becomes dangerous to eat such turtles. There are even recorded cases with hungry people ate common box turtles, and it was later revealed the latter ate toadstools. Oops. But one more important question remains. How do animals understand what is edible and what is not? And whether they understand it at all, do they have some kind of list passed down from generation to generation? Well, it's both yes and no. Of course, not a single camel keeps a list of edible cacti inherited from their grandmother, but many creatures rely on their instincts and experience to determine what is edible. For example, herbivores in the wild eat some plants and ignore others. They learn from the experiences of their parents, and so do predators. It doesn't work with pets, though. There's certainly any genetic memory that makes makes dogs chew on the TV remote, boots, or socks. There was zero sense in eating that. I doubt this dog was lacking socks in his body. Parrots are a different story. They know exactly why they eat soil. Wait, soil. Yeah, many species of South American parrots lick or even swallow clay, and this is completely okay. For them, of course. Some of the birds get calcium and sodium this way, others an antidote for toxic seeds. So maybe we should all try some soil from time to time if it's so healthy. Well, let's rather not. Eating soil is risky because you can run into parasites like roundworms, get tetanus, damaged tooth enamel, get digestive issues, or generally eat something bad. Too bigger risk for the mere piece of clay. Let's leave it to the parents. They know exactly what they're doing, which cannot be said about plastic eating plankton. Today, tons of garbage float in the world's oceans, and it inevitably interferes with the food chain. Plastic is absorbed by cope pods, small crustaceans. In the video, you can see plankton eating microscopic granules of polystyrene, these tiny green things. These granules could be used for making disposable tableware. Usually, copods feed on certain types of algae and using chemical receptors distinguish between what they can eat and what not. But it looks like their aim is a little off. Does plastic harm plankton? Well, it certainly doesn't do it any good. It's like a hamburger from a nearby diner. If you eat it, you won't feel hungry for a long time, but your body won't appreciate it. And if you're on a permanent burger diet, or in the case of plankton, plastic diet, then you can have health issues. Plankton can't complain them. At least it knows how to get rid of the plastic it consumes. Most animals don't have this ability. The result is sad and predictable. Here I probably need to say something about ecology, garbage, recycling, and other important things, but you already know that, right? See you later.